Good evening. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of David McCain, CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming. Let me begin by acknowledging the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, including lead sponsor Bank of America, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, WBUR, and NECN. Any conversation on the state of our national politics, including many that have taken place on this stage, must include discussion of the role of the media as a filter between the public and our national leaders. This is as true today as it was during President Kennedy's time. You may recall that he once commented on that filtering process during his time in our nation's highest office when asked by a reporter if, as president, he still had time to read national newspapers. He replied, yes, I'm reading them more and enjoying them less. <laughs> Tonight, we could not have a better pairing of speakers and topic to discuss the changing role of our national media and its effect on the political climate of our times. Charlie Gibson was anchor of World News with Charles Gibson from 2006 to 2009, capping a 35-year career as a broadcast journalist, primarily with ABC News. From moderating presidential debates to interviewing world leaders, he is known and respected for his in-depth coverage of American politics and culture. The last time he was here at the library was during the days of national mourning when Senator Edward M. Kennedy lay in repose in this very room. Not surprisingly, his crew was among the first to arrive and to ask to broadcast that evening's newscast direct from the library. They were soon followed by Mr. Gibson himself, who spent time talking with the tens of thousands who had come to pay their respects and reading their condolence book entries to understand the spirit of the moment before his program went on air. When we allow one national news team to broadcast live from our site, our policy is to allow all others the same opportunity. And though we try not to show any bias, I'll simply note that Mr. Gibson did his broadcast from our signature space in the library pavilion while his competitors battled the ocean winds outside. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Williams. <laughs> <laughs> the last time Mr. Gibson participated in our forum program was on the opening day of the 2004 baseball season, perhaps the lucky charm that led to a certain curse being reversed later that fall. <laughs> a baseball fan throughout his life, he watched President Kennedy throw out the first pitch at a senator's game in April of 1962, he opened that session with a touch of his signature wit, indicating that as a journalist, it was his job to keep on top of breaking news. He shared the following flash from the wires, quote, after losing their first game of the season last night, the New York Yankees, he reported, have shored up their pitching, hitting, and defense today by signing every single player in professional baseball. <laughs> Mr. Gibson is currently a fellow at Harvard's Shorenstein Center where he's examining the polarization and incivility in our nation's capital and in contemporary political culture. Callie Crosley is one of the moderators this library turns to most often, and all of us who live locally and used to have to wait until Friday nights to hear her on Beat the Press are thrilled with WGBH's wisdom to now feature her daily with her own afternoon radio program. She is an award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker and was a producer for many years for ABC News. We'll begin this evening with a few opening comments for Mr. Gibson. Please join me in welcoming him and Callie Crosley back to the Kennedy Library. Thank you, Tom. I'd forgotten that uh, story about the Yankees, but it was true. Uh, they had done that, and uh, they're probably going to pay Cliff Lee $87 billion to come and shore up that pitching staff now as well. Uh, the New York Yankees uh, and their approach to buying players is obscene. Um, now, I... <laughs> quick way to ingratiate yourself with the Boston crowd, right? <laughs> um, but I, I actually, uh, I didn't grow up rooting for the Red Sox. I grew up um, rooting for the Washington Senators, uh, having been a young man in, in Washington, D.C., and 
having my heart broken twice when that team moved out of town. And we went 30 years without baseball, and I'm delighted to say we have a team back in Washington now. Um, so in the American League, uh, I root for the Red Sox. Actually, I root for any team that's playing the Yankees. <laughs> and, uh, but that's usually to the benefit of the Red Sox if the Yankees are beaten. And, um, and then I root for the Washington Senators in the National League, who are proving to be just as bad as the Washington Senators were in the American League. <laughs> The only thing that's changed, you know, it used to be America first in, or Washington first in, first in peace, first in war, and last in the American League. And now it's first in war, first in peace, and last in the National League. Uh, but we're trying, and perhaps within my lifetime, we'll win a few games. Um, I, I really just at the beginning was going to tell a story, which is my only connection uh, really to uh, Senator Kennedy. I was at Sidwell Friends School um, in 1960 during the election. And Tricia uh, Nixon and Julie Nixon went to Sidwell. Um, and so we were very interested in the campaign, involved in the campaign. And then Senator Kennedy won. And I lived, uh, if you know Washington, I lived in Georgetown. My parents had a house at 34th and O. And just two blocks away was Senator Kennedy's house at 33rd and N. And um, there were rumors that the, our neighbor right across the street, a man David, David K.E. Bruce, who had been ambassador to England, was going to be Secretary of State. And that was really the name that was most prominently mentioned. My room was on the front of the house. I was up at midnight one night, uh, soon after the election. I think it was about six weeks after the election, doing uh, my homework. And I heard this ruffle in the street. Uh, there was some commotion going on. I went to the window to look out. And what today would be considered a relatively short uh, motorcade had pulled up and out of this Cadillac got the president-elect of the United States. And he walked into David Bruce's house. And I thought, aha, I'm the first to know <laughs> David Bruce is going to be the Secretary of State. So I cut school the next day, at least this is as I remember it. And I went to the 33rd and in. It was very informal. You could just stand there on the street. I mean, there wasn't, you know, six blocks cordoned off by, sec by Secret Service. There was only about ten reporters standing outside the house and three cameras and me and a couple of neighbors. And I was telling everybody that David Bruce was about to be named Secretary of State. <laughs> my first big story. And out he walks with this bald guy that I never saw before in my life never heard of, and announces that Dean Rusk is Secretary of State. <laughs> it was my first big story. It was the first time I was wrong, but there have been many since. Uh, <laughs> it set a pattern for my life in journalism. I then went off to uh, college. Uh, I was admitted to Princeton University for reasons that still befuddle me. And uh, I went there, and I was, first of all, I was the worst student in the freshman class at Princeton University. Second, I was miserable. And for some reason that I have forgotten, my parents and I began exchanging letters, but we weren't addressing them to Charlie Gibson, 18 Middle Dodd, Princeton University. They were sending letters to, I don't know, Tab Hunter, 18 Middle Dodd, Princeton University. I was writing back to John Wayne, 1422 33rd Street, Northwest. And I don't know why this developed, but one day I wrote a letter to President and Mrs. John F. Kennedy 1422 33rd Street, Washington, D.C., 2007. And it was one of those letters that I hope you've never had from any of your children. I'm miserable here. I don't like it. I don't know why I came here. There are no girls. Um, there's nobody to date. There's just my roommates, and they're sort of scrungy. Um, uh, I'm failing economics. It was just it was one of those awful letters. And about five or six days later, an envelope appeared in my mailbox, and in the upper left-hand corner, it said, the White House. <laughs> oh, no. And I thought, damn, my dad is good. He got a piece of, <laughs> he got a piece of White House stationery to answer my letter. I thought that would, but it was written to Mr. Charles Gibson, 18 Middle Dodd, Princeton University. And I opened it up, and inside was my letter that had been cut open, obviously, by some machine. And then I looked at the front of my envelope, and the 1422 30, or the 1422 33rd Street had been crossed off, and it said the White House, Washington. And there was another letter in there from Letitia Baldridge, 
who was, I think her title was Mrs. Kennedy's social secretary. And it said, Dear Mr. Gibson, the president, Mrs. Kennedy, and I have all read your letter. <laughs> and we are so sorry that you're having the difficulties that you're encountering at Princeton. The president remembers the few weeks he spent on the Princeton campus when he enrolled there and can share your unhappiness. We hope that things will get better and that you will enjoy your four years there in the long term. But the president says, if you want to think about Harvard, maybe you ought to give it some consideration. He was much happier once he got there. That's my connection with John F. Kennedy. Um, I, and, and, you know, now, can you imagine what that letter would be worth? I was so oh chagrined and you so embarrassed that I, that I tore it up and threw it away. I was mortified. Uh, so only my mother and father saw it, and they were mortified <laughs> as well. Uh, it was not the uh, most clever thing that I ever did in my life. Anyway, with that as preface, uh, it is wonderful to be here. You're all nice to come out on such a cold night. And uh, I look forward to this, uh, taking Callie's questions and some of yours, but go easy on me. I've been retired now for a year, and I haven't the faintest idea what's going on. <laughs> well, we don't believe that. Good evening. <laughs> oh, that was tepid. I'm, I'm with him on that. Good evening. Yeah. All right, there we go. <laughs> It is a delight to be here with one of the nation's capital J journalists, um, and that is Charles Gibson, as we have watched him on ABC News for many years and as he continues to be. Uh, and so when you come to a setting like this where you have a conversation with someone with his bona fides, you want to begin the conversation off the news. And let me take a pause and uh, remind all of you, those who have not been here before, that you will also have an opportunity to ask him questions. So our conversation will be brief, and then you'll be able to step up to the podium to ask questions. By the way, I can tell you, I can anticipate, just to short circuit some things. Uh, I hosted Good Morning America, as you know, for, uh, maybe you don't, but I, uh, <laughs> a lot of people who don't. Um, but I did that for 19 years. And whenever I would take questions on that subject, I can, I can anticipate what the first three questions will be if you ask about Good Morning America. So let me short circuit things. Uh, number one, uh, 3.20 a.m. <laughs> okay. Number two, yes, that is very early. <laughs> and number three, she's just as nice in person as she appears on television. <laughs> Those would be the questions. <laughs> However, that's not my first question. So. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> um, in the news, all of us in this room uh, have heard the name Julian Assange and um, WikiLeaks. And Mr. Assange is at this moment in a British, uh, in a, he's in the clink, he's in a British prison, um, arrested for distributing government secrets. But he wrote an editorial for the Australian newspaper and I'm going to just uh, read a couple parts of it, and then I'm going to ask um, Charles Gibson to respond. He begins his editorial saying, In 1958, a young Rupert Murdoch, then owner and editor of Adelaide's The News, wrote, In the race between secrecy and truth, it seems inevitable that truth will always win. And he goes, goes on to say, and this is the part that I want to discuss, because WikiLeaks and the crisis or the concern about it has been cast as a journalistic one. WikiLeaks, he says, coined a new type of journalism, scientific journalism. We work with other media outlets to bring people the news, but also to prove it is true. Scientific journalism allows you to read a news story, then to click online to see the original document it is based on. That way you can judge for yourself. Is the story true? Did the journalist report it accurately? Democratic societies need a strong media, and WikiLeaks is part of that media. The media helps keep government honest. So, what do you think? <laughs> uh, first of all, isn't that an unfortunate name, WikiLeaks? It sounds like a, <laughs> oh, it sounds to me like a urinary disease. But um, <laughs> I, it seems to me he could have uh, picked something a little bit more august. Uh, I have trouble with this one uh, because, uh, first of all, I don't think uh, I'm not a lawyer. 
but I think it would be awfully hard, as some legislators have suggested, to prosecute him under the Espionage Act of 1917 simply because he uses that defense that he wants to better conditions by uh, by leaking these documents as opposed to making things worse. I, whether he believes that in his own heart, I don't know. What his motives in his own heart are, I don't know. And as somebody who comes from my profession, I believe in transparency. And I, and I think that ma the maximum amount of transparency that you have, um, the better off the public is served. Having said that, um, you also have to respect the fact that the government declares many items to be secret. Uh, there have been many stories in the past that they overuse that, uh, and I think they do. Um, but you have to be able to protect some level of confidentiality within government dealings. So I think where I draw the line is, I think transparency is good, that we see the Johnson tapes, uh, that we know as much about the Kennedy administration as we do, that we know about the events leading up to the Vietnam War, during the war, etc. But where I draw the line is this is contemporary. This is documents, these are documents that are within the last few months and I think can have a chilling effect on, uh, on the way the United States government does business. Uh, I rather liked some foreign leader, I've forgotten who it was, who said, I'm not offended by what they say about me in those documents. You should see what I say about the Americans. <laughs> um, but, but I, I, so I have real problems with his doing this. I think it is wrong. Um, he's paying something of a price in that uh, Various organs like Amazon are now dropping uh, WikiLeaks, and, and I think uh, he's doing his website in, or his, I think he's doing his goal and his website some harm by what he has done. But you can't stop him. Uh, the cat's out of the bag. If you can find a way to prosecute him, I suspect he would be, but I don't think he's prosecutable. And I think this is going to go on, and I think it's something we're going to have to deal with. I find it unfortunate because these are contemporary documents, and I would prefer to see those protected. Is he practicing journalism as he says he is? He himself is not a journalist as I would define, I think as you would define, but is he practicing journalism? Well, is the New York Times practicing journalism when they take the documents that he's giving them? Somebody's giving him the documents, he publishes them, he gives them to the New York Times, they publish them. Are they practicing journalism? Uh, it's interesting to watch the New York Times try to stand on its head and justify exactly what it's doing and saying, well, we've redacted some things and we've you know, protected, whatever. But basically, the pressure on organizations like the Times, Washington Post, others on the ABC, uh, is to publish because it's out there. And you try to uh, redact things that would be um, threatening to some people personally or uh, not to name names that to need to be protected. But this guy doesn't worry about that. Um, so is he practicing journalism? No, not in the traditional sense. But, but you know, there's nothing traditional about journalism right now. Um, we are in a, a totally um, revolutionary time in what journalism is, and we don't know how it's going to come out. We need serious journalism now more than ever, but the traditional means by which news is delivered is changing. Whether there will be an ABC evening newscast in 10 years, I don't know. I certainly hope there will be, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that ABC News is a business model that can exist long term. You're looking at the incredible shrinking newspaper. Uh, the Boston Globe is a great newspaper. Uh, it's wafer thin some days, um, and I, I, I grieve for that. Um, the three legs that newspapers have stood on, which is advertising, classifieds, and circulation. Classifieds are gone. Uh, advertising is drying up. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to support that business model. And in, in the broadcast area, we've now, you know, we had three voices when I was growing up. Um, now we have 600 channels on cable, a dozen of them are devoted to news, and that's not to count the food news, the law news, the education news, the medical news, all of which have their own channels, and the entertainment news, and the pop culture news, etc. Um, and eventually I think we're going to get to the point that your computer is hooked up to your television set, and I don't think you'll have any more cable. You're simply going to be able to take those websites that are producing video, websites like Politico are now doing this, the New York Times is going to become basically a hybrid of, uh, of a printed paper and, and the video. They're going more and more into video if you go into their site. Um, and I think you're going to find very soon that your computer's hooked up to your television set. Then we've got an infinite number of channels. And 
And this kind of journalism, I think, to the extent that people can do it, will be all over the place, and that worries me. Well, what you've just been discussing, much of that, is the delivery system by which journalism has operated, and that is changing, as you said, and that is some, that's going away. But the question for many are, can you hold up the tenets of journalism through whatever platform may be available to distribute that information? And can uh, what has been for many years a, a core principle of journalism uh, one that you spoke of in your last moments on the ABC World News, objectivity. objectivity. Yeah. Can that be something that carries forth? And this is what you said. Objectivity is not universally in favor in our business these days, but it is critically important. It is what we strive for each night. It is my hope that is what you have looked for, and that is what you have found when you have come to ABC's World News. Um, is it what can be found today in many outlets? <laughs> Uh, now, what do you refer to, Kelly? I wonder. Um, uh, first of all, first of all, it's nice to talk to an audience with a little gray hair. Um, <laughs> because I was at Harvard the other day, and I made reference to David Brinkley. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> David Brinkley uh, said there is no such thing as objectivity. There are just lesser degrees of subjectivity. And I think that's true. Um, and you strive, if you grow up in the milieu, which I did, you strive to achieve that minimal degree of subjectivity every night. And you have to constantly question yourself of why are we doing this, how are we doing this, are we being fair, etc. Now, there are stories that sometimes um, you don't worry about a couple of points of view. I am convinced, for instance, um, though there are people who are you know, soundly convinced that there is a problem with inoculations that are causing autism. I think the overwhelming evidence presented to me is that that is not the case. I know these people desperately want, uh, they want answers. Uh, if you have an autistic child, my God, that, you know, what a burden that is and, and what, a, how, what a hardship that is for people. Um, you know, there are people who dispute global warming and, and whatever I'm, I, I, so in, there are some stories in which you, in which perhaps you, you lean one way or the other. But overall, certainly within a political context, you try to be as objective as you can. There are, Roger Ailes at Fox has uh, come up with a business model which is extraordinarily successful. The profit of Fox News is greater than ABC, CBS, and NBC News combined. Um, he is making um, the profits of that network are somewhere around $700 million. Now, I will tell you something which is interesting. When I, I probably shouldn't talk about this, but when I left ABC News, <clears throat> the president of the ABC News division came to me and said, your show from 6.30 to 7, we were second to Brian at that point. We are about a half million homes behind, but we were very respectable, close second. He said, if you take your rating from 6.30 to 7 and you combine it with MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, Headline News, and CNBC combined, combined, you are well over 200% of their combined audience, more than twice. But each one of those five entities is making more money on the half hour than we are. And the reason is that whenever you write your cable check for, I don't know what it is, 60 bucks a month or something. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Way more than that. <laughs> um, you know, 12 cents of that goes to CNN, uh, 9 cents goes to MSNBC, 20 cents goes to Fox, $87 goes to ESPN. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but those subscription fees are something not available to the commercial networks, to the over-the-air networks. And yet, the ABC Evening News was essentially a cable program. 90 3% of the people who watch the ABC Evening News watched it on their cable system. But we get not a dime for that. And those cable entities make money. So Rogers come up with what is an extraordinarily successful entity, although his audience is relatively small. Um, I have a study group uh, at Harvard, or had one, because uh, I'm only here for a semester. But uh, I brought Britt Hume up from Fox News to talk to them. And Britt defended, said, you know, Fox News during the day is as responsible as any other news organization. It's terrific. Um, we do a good job of news, and then they do opinion at night. 
and you have to respect Fox. Um, Roger, we, we feel that the news media is left-leaning, and that's an impression that a lot of people have. And we're trying to look at stories with a slightly different angle, and we feel we are fair and balanced. And one of the kids held up his hand and said, well, then why do you advertise Glenn Beck, Sean Hannity, and Bill O'Reilly? Why are they the, the faces that are on all the ads for Fox News? Good job, kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was proud of them. Um, uh, but it is, it, it's not going to go away. Is it fair and balanced? I don't think so. Um, and, and Britt will say, look, we have Juan Williams and we have other people on there who are of a liberal persuasion. But I think overwhelmingly uh, they're on there as you know, straw men to be knocked down. And I, I, and I think it's very, very unfortunate because it is not reflective of the, of the, as I say, the milieu in which I grew up and in which I believe. But it is what it is. It's not going to change. They're making a lot of money out of it. MSNBC is making a lot of money now. And if Roger Ailes turned around tomorrow and said, we're going to be absolutely objective in everything we do, their audience would go somewhere else to find somebody who fills the void that he is now filling. So we're stuck with this. And the politicians in Washington, they can rail against it all they want. Jay Rockefeller unfortunately stood up the other day and said MSNBC and Fox ought to be taken off the air. He didn't want to say that. I think, I think he would agree it was not something you don't want to be in the censorship business. But uh, it is what it is, and it's going to be there. And when I go out and talk to young people, I urge them, urge them to pursue and to try to find news sources which are as objective as possible, to, to seek out opinions which are different from their own. Um, but we're in this... We are in this reality, and it is a reality, that you're going to have opinion-based news. I think you're going to have more of it when these websites begin to be more, um, because it's niche broadcasting. And if you can make a lot of money, as Roger Ailes has done, broadcasting to that niche, other people will, what we call narrow cast, go for very specific portions of the audience. Uh, and maybe the way to get noticed in that, in that business is to be more shrill and to be more opinionated. I don't know. I hope that's not the case, but I think it is. So it has to be the consumer that draws the distinction of what is the news they want to hear, and I hope they will. That's why I said that at the, in the last show. I hope they will seek out objectivity or as objective, the lesser degree of subjectivity that you can find. I think it's absolutely critical, and, and I worry that not only are people gravitating to news which reinforces their already formed prejudices. But I also worry uh, that when you go onto a website that may reflect your political point of view, when it links you to other websites, they're all of similar bent. So the only thing you have to do as a consumer, I don't need to tell you what to do, but my, I, the only thing I wish you would do as a consumer is keep in mind I want to find as objective a source of news as I can. Um, I will tell you, having spoken to many college students, that they don't understand what the difference is. So there are many, number, many studies, some of you may know, which have demonstrated in no uncertain terms that people are going to their niche ideology spots when they seek out any information. That is the only place where they reside. So then you talk to people about being media literate, and that's not a concept. That's exactly what you're suggesting, but people actually don't know how to begin in that way. Certainly people who, as you were, started with um, kind of the mainstream information that everybody gathered around in a fireplace kind of chat and got the same information. We are now at a point where you cannot assume... But you can't, Kelly. I mean, when Bill O'Reilly calls somebody a pinhead, you've got a pretty good idea that he doesn't, uh, you're not, you know, well, yeah, terribly but... taken with their point of view. Um, uh, they're not shy about what it is they're saying, and I think I, I really believe in the, in the good judgment of the American people and that they um, will seek out, will find news that is, that is objective. I, I think they will. I believe they will. Um, you know, Fox, as I say, Fox's audience is minuscule uh, in the overall pantheon of things, but it's very profitable. Uh, but it's still small, and I think that's because people do tend to seek out voices that make them think, that, not tells, that doesn't tell them what to think, but allows them to make their own. You know, the, the slogan, we report, you decide, is, is a terrific slogan. Yeah. I believe in that. I wish they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, what you've been studying at the Shorenstein, or what you've been working on as your project? By the way, one of the, let, me, let me stop here. One mm -hmm. of the things that's really interesting to me, and I'm not clear what the reasons are, is the degree to which we have tended not only to watch things in the news that may reinforce our viewpoints, but there has been a migration politically of people in this country so that more and more areas are very decided in one political area or another. Um, as you know, there's only now a few states that are really contested in presidential elections. Uh, the networks, the national networks, don't make almost not a dime out of political advertising because presidential candidates don't need to, to advertise nationally. So they put their money into Florida, Ohio, New Hampshire, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> we have a good station in New Hampshire, so I'm pleased. But, but uh, uh, I mean, that's where they spend their money. They spend their money in a very limited number of states. In 1976, in the Ford-Carter race, I was just looking at these numbers today, 25% of the counties in America gave either President Ford or Governor Carter 60% of the vote or more. That, that that candidate won by more than 20%. It was 28%. In 2004, in the Kerry-Bush race, that was up to 49% of the counties in this country gave one candidate 60%, one candidate or the other 60%. We're tending to wind up or we're tending to move to, or gravitate to, or migrate to areas of similar political thought to our own. I'm not sure why that's the case, but it disturbs me. It worries me. It, and, and I pick out counties because you can't redistrict mm -hmm. a county. You can redistrict a congressional, uh, and, and as you know, redistricting is, is used for, for nasty purposes sometimes to make sure a district is Democratic or Republican. But in counties, you don't change the lines. Um, and as I say, almost twice the number of counties, 20% uh, more, are um, very inclined toward, toward one party or another. And, and I'm, I'm not sure why that's the case, but I think it's unfortunate. Well, and that, that, that's, I'm working in polarization. Which yeah, is that's where I was going. Uh, that, that your, the study, that, the work that you've been doing at the Shorenstein has to do with polarization in the broadest sense, but also at the media as influencer in, the, in our general polarization yeah. in society and some of the incivility that we're experiencing in just having an exchange of ideas or so-called ex exchange of ideas. And your former colleague, Ted Koppel, wrote a piece for the Washington, Washington Post, Post. Yeah. Um, which you know, kicked off this conversation again, certainly in journalism circles. And he said many things, but, but here's a relevant paragraph. And so among many, the many benefits we have come to believe the Founding Fathers intended for us, the latest is news we can choose, beginning perhaps from the reasonable perspective that absolute objectivity is unattainable. Fox News and MSNBC no longer even attempt it. They show us the world not as it is, but as partisans and loyal viewers at either end of the political spectrum would like it to be. This is to journalism what Bernie Madoff was to investment. He told his customers what they wanted to hear, and by the time they learned the truth, their money was gone. That's up yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure about the Bernie Madoff analogy, but, but yeah, I know where he, where he was going. Um, so, yeah, so. You're, you're, this is, you're, you're agreeing with him. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I want to talk about media's influence in this. I'm not going to expand on, on, Ted yeah. Koppel's, uh, on Ted Koppel's thinking. Um, I, I think it's right. Mm -hmm. and, and it worries me. Now, as Bernie Madoff, you know, winds up in jail. I'm not sure that these people, um, that's why I'm uncomfortable with the analogy. Uh, you know, Bernie Madoff was a crook, and he stole from people. I don't think necessarily in this case you're stealing from people. But, but politicians will tell you this is one of the things that disturbs them. I've talked to a bunch of them in conjunction with the, the work I'm doing at the Shorenstein Center, and, and they all worry about this. And they worry specifically about the if, – if you want to be a moderate in today's political spectrum, you're in trouble. Um, Bob Bennett, I don't know how many of you know who he is, but Bob Bennett was a, is a Republican senator from Utah uh, who is conservative. I think everybody would say he's quite conservative. But um, he did a couple of things. He voted for TARP, um, and he co-sponsored a health care bill with Ron Wyden, a Democrat from Oregon. 
And when he came to the convention, Utah chooses its candidates by convention. When he came to the convention in, um, in Utah, he didn't even, he finished third. He'd served three terms, I think, if I'm not incorrect, um, in the Senate, was a revered member of the Senate, had seniority, a lot of good he was able to do for Utah. They booted him out because he wasn't right wing enough. Now, we're in a very dangerous situation. And you follow my math here for a minute, if you will. We're in a very dangerous situation in which a third of the country's, I mean, excuse my rough statistics here, but a third of the country is Republican, a third is Democrat, a third is Independent. So only one third of the voters are eligible to vote in the Republican primary in some, most states, and only a third of the Democrats, uh, only a third of the population is eligible to vote in a Democratic primary. Well, that's one third. And we have 20% participation in off-year primaries. So now you've got 20% of one-third. You have one-fifth of one-third actually voting in those primaries. And then, as you know, it only takes 50% of the vote to win the nomination. So you multiply one-third times one-fifth times one-half, and you've got one-thirtieth of the eligible voters deciding who the candidate should be. Now, who are those candidates that they're going to elect? Who's going to vote in those primaries? It is the most ideologically devote, uh, dedicated conservatives and liberals. And so we have the candidates, the parties, moving further and further apart from one another. And that's disturbing. Um, <laughs> one senator said, yeah, it's the wing nuts of the parties who choose the, who choose the candidates. Well, wing nuts is a little unfair, I think, as is the Bernie Madoff analogy. But, but it's really, really disturbing. And it is a tremendous problem in terms of the fact that polarization and the inability of, candidate, or of, of politicians to engage in Washington uh, is really tragic. Um, and and what, what's been the media's responsibility in this, though? How much, has, what, how much has the influence of the media played a part in leading to this kind of polarization. Well, all of this, you know, all of this predated Fox News, and all of this predated MSNBC. Uh, the beginnings of this really, um, the best I can find anybody who dates it is really with the election of Jesse Helms to the Senate in 1972, uh, and basically the um, the election of Newt Gingrich to the House in 1978. And many people, even Republicans, will say to you. Gingrich, and you cannot argue with the results that he achieved, but his basic idea was he had to blow up the House in order to get the Republicans into the majority because for 40 years they had been the minority party. And for most of those 40 years, the, the Republicans had been the minority in the Senate as well. And so basically he blew it up. He created a culture of corruption. Uh, he went after Jim Wright, who was the Speaker of the House, got him on a book deal. He went after Tony Coelho, who was head of the uh, the, the Democratic Cam Campaign Committee he went after Bill Gray, who was an esteemed member of the of the House from Pennsylvania. Uh, Gray resigned from Mysterio. We never knew what the scandal was there, but he resigned rather quickly. Quello resigned. Uh, they went after Tom Foley, and it was private detectives and that kind of stuff. I mean, that's really, um, you know, that's nasty stuff. And uh, and then you, you turn around and say, okay, well, let's be friends and cooperate on legislation. No, it's not going to happen. And so there is a. Uh, um, I think there's a frozen quality in Washington right now um, in, in doing the work that I'm doing. I talked to Bill Frist, a Republican Tennessee, used to be the majority leader, uh, and Joe Califano, who was a member of the Johnson administration and the Carter administration. I talked to them on the same night for an event that I was at. They both used exactly the same words. Washington is a broken city, and you cannot get a Congress that is this polarized to deal realistically with problems. Um, so we're not getting the deficit dealt with. We're not getting spending dealt with. Uh, just look at the, at the circus that the tax bill has become down in Washington. We're, we're three weeks from ne next year, and you don't know what your tax bill is going to be. And for a small businessman not to know how to plan for what his taxes are going to be, that's a disgrace on the part of the United States Congress. And, and now, that I don't know if you saw the news today, the, the Democrats in the House are not going to bring up the agreement that the, that the president made with the Republicans because they don't like it. Mm -hmm. When there's all sorts of, there's a START treaty that's waiting in the wings. There's the DREAM Act, which is really important. There's, uh, they rejected know, the DREAM Act today. Well, they rejected cloture on the right. DREAM Act. Mm -hmm. they, were, they didn't vote, they don't have the guts to vote on the bill itself. They vote on cloture. And, um, and, and then they're not acting on, you know, don't ask, don't tell. 
um, they're, they're locked. So we don't get immigration policy dealt with. We don't get um, so many things. We don't get Social Security reform. We don't get true health care reform. We don't get um, Medicare to taken care of in the long run. Who knows what the cost effects of this new bill. And, and the Republicans, I, I hold no water for either party, but the Republicans run on a basis of cutting the deficit. And then they extend tax cuts, which are going to add $4 trillion to the deficit. And what do the Democrats get out of it? They get an extension of unemployment benefits, which is going to cost another $56 billion. Now, it may be very important that people have their unemployment benefits extended for 13 months. It is. But long run, it's all costing the government more money. It's a, it is a disgrace what's going on in Washington right now, not to offer an opinion or anything. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and yet this polarization is, is part of it. Uh, polarization is a big cause of it. But how, how, I mean, if, Sorry to get if, the if you if you uh, if, if we understand and we have, we have made this point that people are more and more going to niche places to have their views reflected and they believe only that, then the media's influence uh, gives a lot of room for. Well, I, I, I still I, I would still contend, Kelly, that, that yeah. it's a relatively small audience. But but I come back to the point: it's a relatively small group of people who are voting, and I, I think the relationship between the more partisan voices in, in, in the public sphere and the people who, who vote, and also the people who give money. Uh, money is a big part of this, and, and the recent uh, Citizens United v. Federal Elections Commission decision is not helping this in any way. We're getting, I, I, I loved, Justice Stevens is now retired, but Justice Stevens wrote the, the and, and that's a really interesting decision. It's a, it's a it's a free speech case in many respects, and whether corporate speech can be considered the same as, and union speech can be considered the same as individual speech. But Justice Stevens, in his dissent, um, and he has wonderful wry lines in a lot of his dissents, wrote his dissent, and I'm, I'm not going to quote it exactly because I can't remember, but he said, uh, there are many problems with the American democracy, but it is apparently only the majority of this court that thinks one of those problems is not enough corporate money in American politics. <laughs> uh, he gets his digs in when he can, but he was in the minority of the 5-4 decision. So, I, I, you know, I, can you blame the media? I, no, I don't blame the media for this, okay. um, uh, but I'm, a, I'm from the media, so what would you expect me to do? But uh, um, I, I blame the voters for not participating, for not getting hipped up about this. Um, and I blame the politicians for not having the guts uh, to stand up and do what they're elected to do, which is not get reelected, but to legislate. I found a great quote uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin had from Lyndon Johnson, who said, I didn't come to Washington to make principled speeches and to spout my own ideology. I came to Washington to legislate. And damn it, that's what we chose them to do. Why don't you do it? Get on with it. Um. <laughs> Part of your Cheap applause line. Part of, part of your background was covering um, both the White House and the House of Representatives at one point. And I wonder, given what you've just said, uh, just give us a sense of the difference in the level of at least exchange. Um, we're talking about almost a paralyzed state now with people who are opposite ends of the spectrum and never the, will never come to the middle or so it seems. But back when you were covering the House of Representatives, I mean, people had strong disagreements and, and held different ideologies, but uh, what, what, what was the difference? Um, Tip O'Neill um, used to meet with uh, the Republican leadership uh, every couple of weeks. Um, go back even further. Sam Rayburn used to have Democrats and Republicans in uh, to what they called the Board of Education, and they would uh, almost every night uh, sit around with a glass of bourbon um, and talk about politics. I'm not recommending bourbon to everybody every night, but, but you can get a lot of done over a glass of bourbon, thank you very much, or a poker game, or whatever. But the social, actually what I'm writing a paper about right now, is, is the, the degree of comity, the degree of civility, the degree of engagement between members, the degree of fraternization, the degree of socialization, the, the degree of engagement, if I haven't used that word before, it's gone. Um, the Congress now exists except in things like this lame duck session, basically exists on a Tuesday, early Tuesday afternoon to Thursday night schedule. Wow. The, I, there was a, a freshman, members Congress, uh, freshman members of Congress, newly elected members of Congress conference last week at Harvard. 
I went to talk to the, there were only about 15 who came because the Republicans told their members don't come to, don't go to Harvard. A few of them did, but the Republicans didn't want them tainted by going to Harvard. And, um, and as you know, since this was a totally Republican election, if you had a conference of new members for de new Democratic members, you could have held that in a phone booth. Um, but I asked them, uh, I think there were about 15 left by the time I got around to them. Um, I said, how many of you are moving your families to Washington? One hand. Wow. One. Um, an ex-Marine. God bless him. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the number of members in Congress who had their families in Washington when I covered the body was, I, I don't have any, I've been trying to get the numbers, but I can't, you can't come up with it. But it's, uh, most members will say to me, it was about 60 to two-thirds, 60% mm -hmm. to two-thirds. Now it's a trace element. Newt Gingrich told members, leave your families at home. Um, we'll get you home for five days a week so you can raise money, you can do constituent service, you can mm -hmm. go to all the Elks meetings and whatever, and, and we'll get you in and out of Washington. No, no. Bring your family to Washington. Stand at the sidelines of a soccer game with a member from the other side of the aisle. It's important, those, those times when they get to know one another. Evan Bayh told me about dinners that his dad used to have when he was a senator, Birch Bayh from Indiana. And Chuck Percy would be there, and Charlie Goodell from New York, and Mark Hatfield and Bob Packwood, all Republicans. He said, I haven't been to a dinner in 12 years um, that, that where there were any Republicans. They, and he said, and the other thing he said, which is really bothersome to me, he said, the 100 senators have only met as a group outside the chamber three times in his 12 years that he was in the Senate. Wow. Uh, once was after 9-11, once was to, for, to make up the plans for the impeachment trial of Bill Clinton, and the third was um, at the financial crisis. Uh, those are the only three times. And yet, once a week, they have party caucuses where all the Democrats and Republicans meet separately. And he said, you'd, 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 be, you'd find those meetings a disgrace. Um, uh, selective polling material is presented, which is supposed to whip you up into a frenzy, and, and it's, it's us against them, and whatever. It's now become all about politics, and it's become, it's become a sense of, if you win, I lose. And the president has said, and other presidents have said it, but Barack Obama has said a number of times, in Washington now, every day is election day. And, and the, the House, of course, has to run every two years. The senators will tell you the old adage, that you legislate for four years and run for election, re-election for two years, gone, gone. You're running for re-election all six years. Uh, Evan Bay told me his dad's first run in Indiana cost under $2 million. And he said if I had run for re-election this year, he didn't, he retired. He said I probably would have gotten beat because I'm not liberal enough uh, for the Indiana, and I'm not conservative enough for the state. Republican probably would have beat me if, if I'd gotten the nomination. He said it would have cost me $26 million to run. Hmm. Um, so, and, and I, one of the things I asked to, um, Tom Daschle, who is the former majority leader of the Senate, now, now beaten and out of the Senate, um, I, I said one of the things that interests me, is, you know, one of the places senators can get together is in the Senate dining room at lunch. You know, you all sit together, you have a sandwich, whatever. Um, but the Senate dining room is empty. Mm. And he said, yeah, he said at lunch, you know, you can't raise money from your office. You can't what they call dialing for dollars. You can't do that from your office. So all the senators have off Capitol Hill offices, and they go there at lunchtime and they spend the time raising money mm -hmm. on the two days that they're in Washington. So it's a, it's a terrible, and I don't know how you break that Well, that was going to be my question. Log jam. I don't know how you do it. Um, I don't know how you do it. Uh, there are some practical suggestions, that, but my favorite, my favorite suggestion um, comes from um, a guy named Sir William Mackay, who is the parl retired parliamentarian of the House of Commons in England. I said to him, you have pubs in Westminster, don't you? He said, several. And I said, would it be a good idea to put them in the Capitol? He said, you bet. Um, it's awfully tough, he said, to get mad at somebody when you've shared a pint with them when you walk off the floor. And he said, often, when the debates in the House of Commons get really bitter, uh, members will retire, have a pint of beer, and come on back onto the floor. That's just one suggestion. But uh, there's others. Um, there's others, but, but um, you know, more members should, should, uh, should live in Washington. Um, there should be a 100-senator caucus, uh, probably at least once a month, maybe once every two weeks. Have one party caucus every week. And 
Uh, the other th one that really uh, has attracted me is change the schedule. Don't have Tuesdays or Thursday sessions every week. Bring them in for two weeks. Let them go home for two. In for two, out for two. You're going to get ten days in those two weeks of legislating. Uh, some people suggest it ought to be three weeks in, one week home. Uh, that would be 15 days of working, legislating, and you could have 15 days to raise money. But on those weekends, between the weeks that you're in session, Monday to Friday, you'd get members to stay in Washington and maybe more members to move their families to Washington, which I think uh, would be very important. Well, a wise woman once told me relationship before issue, and what you've just described is their inability to build any relationships. So how much more... How <laughs> How, how, how bad does it have to get before well, somebody it's, it's really, implements it's, it's, something? It's really bad. You now have a member of Congress. I was highly offended, as somebody who's maybe naive, but I was highly offended when a South Carolina congressman yelled out to the mm -hmm. President of the United States during a State of the Union address, you lie. Mm, so was um, I. Uh, you, just, you don't say that to the President of the United States. You just don't. I, I, I take exception to what you say. I, with all due respect, I, I think you're wrong, whatever. You don't say you lie. Now oh, there is that Nixon problem, and there is, <laughs> and then there's that, there was that Bill Clinton problem. But, uh, uh, but, but, you no. Know, I mean, he's the president of the United States. He's all of our president. You don't say that. And then he becomes a hero on the cable channels that you're talking about. And his coffers were, his campaign coffers were, mightily uh, expanded by the uh, comment he made. I think he should have been censured by the House of Representatives. Um, and some House members, some House leaders told me we can't do that because it's a joint session of the Congress. It's not actually the House that's in session. It's a joint session of Congress. What a dodge. Do it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let me switch topics a little bit and um, remind our audience, if they need reminding, that um, you did the first major interview with one Sarah Palin. People always reference the, the uh, is Katie Is it time Curry. to get to the audience questions? <laughs> no. <now? laughs> I get the signal. I haven't gotten on. it yet. <laughs> um, Kelly, and, aren't we out of time for you? Time? <laughs> and I just wonder now, at the moment that you were interviewing her, and this, you know, her answers were becoming what they were, could you ever have imagined, not very long after, that she would be the major influencer she has become? Well, I don't know how major she is, um, and I don't know what she's, what her intentions are now. I rather think that, that, that she wants to keep open the question of whether she'll run for the presidency because that keeps her in front of the public and whatever. I, my gut sense is she won't. Um, when I interviewed her, I, I'm still not clear why I got the interview. We hadn't particularly pushed for it, um, but the people in the, in the McCain campaign uh, called up and said, would you like to do it? Well, sure, yeah. So we went up to Wasilla uh, to do it. And um, I was really worried that, that it would be perceived as asking her gotcha questions. And I really wanted to avoid that um, because it's not fair. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, that's gotcha journalism is just, I don't think, has a place in, in, in what we ought to be doing. So um, the best advice I got was from a friend who used to be the political director of ABC News, now works for Time Magazine, wrote a book called Game Change, if any of you read it, Mark Halpern. And, and I, Mark came in, we were having a strategy meeting of how we were going to prepare for this interview. And Mark Halpern came in and said, don't interview Sarah Palin. I sort of looked at him quizzically, and he said, prepare an interview for Joe Biden, and then ask those questions of Sarah Palin. And I thought that was terrific advice, and so I tried to follow it. Um, I got some hell for asking her the question about, do you agree with the Bush Doctrine? We were talking about this before we came down here. Um, the Bush Doctrine has always fascinated me. Uh, it was promulgated in the latter part of 2000, um, uh, 2001. That was the year of, what year was 9-11? 2001. Uh, it was propagated in the, in the latter part of that year. And I always grew up in the, in the era of no first strike, that the United States would not be the first to employ weapons. We would respond if attacked, but we would never launch those weapons first. Well, now we're not in a, in a um, confrontation with the Soviet Union, and, and the, the, the possibility, thank God, of nuclear weapons being employed is less. 
But when Bush said we have the right to preemptively strike another country that might threaten us, I found that turning American foreign policy on its head. He may be right, he may be wrong. I just found it a, a, a tremendous change in American foreign policy that didn't get as much comment as I thought it should. So I asked her that. Do you agree with the Bush doctrine? And she said, in what respect, Charlie? <laughs> and um, and it, was a, it was apparent to me, it was apparent to me at the time that she probably didn't know what I was talking about. And, and I... And I a lot of conservatives have jumped all over me for asking the question. I, I wanted to help her out. I said, here's what it is. Um, because I, I, I wasn't trying to trip her up at all. Um, but I was really, I felt badly about it, strangely enough. And um, I also said to her, in the, in the middle, because I, I'd never interviewed somebody like that. She, I mean, she just, there was a torrent of words that came out. And I said, I'm getting lost here in a blizzard of words. And I, and I didn't mean that to be critical. I was just saying, I'm not following you. And mm -hmm. I'm, would you slow down, please? Mm -hmm. um, but she was nervous. It was the first national interview she'd done. And, and she was well prepped. And um, actually, the, the, the McCain people thought she did pretty well. But um, um, so I went back to the office and I was feeling sort of badly. And in, in the meeting a couple of days later, I said, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I should have asked that question because uh, I didn't mean to trip her up. And somebody said, don't worry about it. You asked the same question of John McCain during a debate in New Hampshire prior to the New Hampshire primary. And you also asked the question of Ron Paul. I don't know why I asked it of Ron Paul, but I, I did. I was obviously on my mind. So if they'd done some preparation, um, uh, as thorough preparations, they probably should have. They would have known it was something that Gibson's hipped upon. Um, and um, so I don't feel badly about it anymore. Any <laughs> Tepid applause. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you look at the landscape of the changing uh, journalism scene, and it is changing every day, and journalists are trying to find their footing, other than the objectivity, which we've, we've talked about, what do you think an issue um, that faces today's journalists, the 21st century journalists, that, I don't know, maybe you didn't have to deal with at the beginning of your career, but one that is absolutely one that journalists today have for to grapple journalists? with. For yes, journalists. for journalists. Well, I, you know, I want young people to want to go into this profession. I think it's more fun. I think it's more interesting. If I could have done anything in my life, I would have played baseball. Um, but when I was in my latter years of high school and when I got to college, those damn pitchers began to curve the ball. It made it an entirely different game for me, and whenever I swung, the ball was not there. <laughs> uh, and that was a pretty good message. You're not going to be able to play baseball. But the reason I loved baseball is that it is such a collaborative game, and the sense of team in baseball is just something I loved. You love team sports. And, um, at least I did when I grew up. And, and, and j television journalism is such a collaborative effort. I used to, not when I was, when Peter was anchoring, I used to, when I, would, I was a Washington correspondent, I'd come up to New York, I loved to go down into the area where all the pieces get fed in from around the world. And there would be seven or eight, basically in a half hour show, you have 22 minutes and 47 seconds of actual content. Not that I know it, you understand. <laughs> um, each one of those seconds is precious. But you have basically seven or eight correspondent pieces every night. And I used to love to go down into the room where all these pieces would be fed in and there'd be editors taking them in and re-racking them to roll on the show. And at 25 minutes after six, it was probably a pretty good shot that six, or six of those seven pieces weren't in yet. And there were editors working in Washington and editors working in Chicago and a correspondent rewriting his piece in Los Angeles and maybe a piece um, coming to you from Afghanistan or from, uh, from Baghdad. And, and the, the, the degree to which this program, you know, with that guy upstairs, Jennings, and whatever, and, and his blow-dried hair and whatever, I was in that position later, um, the degree to which he depended on dozens and dozens of people around the world, all of whom worked for ABC News, that was the most exciting thing to me in the world. And I want people to, to experience that and to love journalism the way I do. It, I was, I'm so blessed in my life to have been able to done this, do this. But what do you say to a kid who wants to go into journalism today? How is he going to feed his family? 
um, because we don't know how you're going to be able to monetize journalism. We, it, you know, you look at newspapers are laying off people right and left. ABC had to let a quarter of its staff go at the beginning of this year. I can't tell you how something that could pain me more to see those people walk out the door. People I'd worked with for 30 years and I loved. Um, and, and who were those people editing those seven pieces for the show that I was doing? And we're doing that because they didn't want to let ABC News down. They didn't want to let the public down. They didn't want to let the viewer down. Um, you love that. You think you're, you know, you think you're, a, well, you know, you think you're mm -hmm. part of something bigger than, than yourself. And yet, I don't know how you tell somebody where they're going to be able to go into this business and make money now. And that really worries me. We're not, we don't have a new paradigm of how news is going to be delivered. We don't know how it can be monetized. We don't know how reporters can make money at it. We don't know if there's going to be people that we can afford to pay go watch the city council meeting or watch the uh, county board of commissioners or watch the state legislature, which is where the guts of journalism occurs. Uh, and investigative work, my God, in a newspaper today, one of my fellow Shorenstein people uh, this, this semester is working on whether how local papers can afford investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. How can you take Callie and take her, take her, give her two months to look at a story? You can't afford that anymore. You've got to have her in the paper every other day. Uh, it's really, really worrisome to me, far more worrisome than the partisan issues that you're talking about, how we make the business pay. Um, my career was at a crossroad. My wife is here this, tonight, but um, I don't usually like her to come when I'm doing this talking because it makes me nervous that she's sitting there <laughs> taking notes. And, um, <laughs> but uh, my career was really going south at one point. And um, I had been, I was anchoring at the age of 26, 29, a local uh, news show in Washington, and they bounced me. Uh, they said, you're too preppy. <laughs> well, they were probably right. Um, but they said, you're too preppy, and, and we need somebody who's more of the people and whatever, and I got booted off the show. And my career was really going south, and I took a fellowship for a year at the University of Michigan, uh, which was a brand new fellowship sponsored by the federal government. Thank you all for paying for it. And um, modeled after the Neiman Foundation. Yes, it but was. I just digress. Right. Uh, modeled, so I was a the, Neiman fellow, but continue. After the Neiman. Well, I was, a, <laughs> I, was, I was a University of Michigan fellow. But I remember having a, and I, and I went away to think, should I have gone to law school as I wanted to do? Um, should I have gone in a different career? And I remember a conversation with Arlene uh, one night, and I said, I'm never going to, I desperately miss this, but I'm never going to make any money at it. And is that okay? And she said, sure, if you love it, we got a house, you know, the kids are comfortable, we can put food on the table, and if we never make any money on it and you love it, sure. But today, you take a young journalist and you say that, you say, I can't tell you how you're going to be able to raise a family and what you're going to be able to make in journalism. And that scares me. That really, really scares me. Now, I don't want this conversation to be a total downer, because here's the <laughs> <laughs> there is some interesting information as we talk about the changing journalism landscape. Google, Yahoo, a number of these entities that were never set up to do news. But they're aggregators, Colin. Well, wait, but now they're talking about hiring people yep. to do original yep. reporting. Well, Google's not. Uh, but that's kind of interesting to me that you know, there's an acknowledgement that original reporting, which everybody thinks just appears yep. magically, is important. Well, it's one of the interesting yeah. experiments. Ariana Huffington was, it, I'm, I'm not a, um, you know, she, she has a political point of view, and I wish, I wish her website were a little more objective than it is. But uh, she was at Harvard the other day talking about the fact that she started as an aggregator. She was just putting on her website news that other people were reporting, other people had gathered. That's what we refer to them as aggregators. Uh, Google is an aggregator. Yahoo That's News right. is an aggregator. AOL News is an aggregator. They take, they're not producing anything originally of their own. They're just taking things that other people report, putting it on their website. But Ariana Huffington started that way. She started with a capitalization of only $10 million. And she's built up this website. Now she's hired 70 reporters. Tina Brown's done the same thing with the Daily Beast. Um, she's hiring some really good people. Um, so you don't know. Maybe that's, and, and maybe they're going to go into a, a, a video component. Politico started with Political News as an original reporting organ. They have grown rather markedly. Now they're starting a video service. I think they're going to go full-time into video. 
Um, Though I would note that their, their money comes from the print edition, which we never see. If you're familiar with Politico.com and you're aware of those reporters, the, the print edition is only distributed in Washington. And oddly, in this time, that's the moneymaker. Yep, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, mm -hmm. And you can get it at the airport and whatever. When you're in the yeah. Washington airport, pick it up because it's, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and you can subscribe to it. Um, but they're not making money. I yeah. mean, uh, they're, they're underwritten by Joe Albritton, who owns uh, Channel 7 in Washington. And um, I, I think, I hope, that they're going to make money long term. But we don't know how, wh where the money's going to come from for any of these entities. Uh, we don't know how you're going to, when we do hook up our computer to our television set, how are you going to pay for that? Are you going to only have certain websites that you can get on your TV set? Are you going to pay a blanket fee for, well, we just don't know. Um, what about like Boston Globe putting certain information behind a paywall right now? Yeah, you know, there, uh, there's a lot of news. The New York Times is going to try this as well. Exactly. It's trying to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, you know, they, the, the, the philosophy, the beginning philosophy was we'll give our stuff away on the Internet. That will draw people to our newspaper. Little did we know that they were going to take the free stuff and not, I mean, what kind of a brain surgeon does it take to figure out you're going to use the free stuff and you're not going to pay the money? I never, I never understood it. We used to have these meetings at abcnews.com and they'd say, well, we, you know, we're going to put all this stuff on the website and people can get it and, and that'll drive them to your show. No, no, you know, don't give it away. <laughs> don't give it away. Um, uh, you know, protect it, hold on to it. Um, but now there's a lot of people, the Wall Street Journal is trying the same thing, the New York Times is trying. I don't know if it's going to be successful or not. Uh, Time Magazine a couple of years ago wrote a piece that maybe you'd pay a nickel every time you got, you know, a story online. That's not going to work, I don't think. Um, um, what would they call it? Micro payments or something. Right. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. We just don't know. We don't know. And there's a whole lot of smart people at Harvard trying to figure out what the new paradigm is going to be, and they don't know. So uh, I can't answer it either. I'd like to know what Charlie Gibson reads and taps into every day as you get your information. Where does it come from? Where are you looking? <laughs> well, I, I, I should tell you... Uh, <laughs> that I know you like, can name the It doesn't sound like a hard reading. question, but it is. <laughs> uh, I, used to, I used to, you know, have a lot of news sources uh, when I was working. And one of the things I wanted to put down was being so involved in, uh, in reading stuff all the time. So much of my day was doing that. I still spend a lot of time on the web, and I look at NewYorkTimes.com, I look at WSJ, I look at the Washington Post, uh, because, because they have the best sports columnists, even better, I think, than the Boston Globe, uh, <laughs> although it's a very close race uh, for good sports sections. Um, and I read the Times, but I don't read anything as... The only paper I buy is the Times. I buy the Wall Street Journal a couple of times a week because it has, I think it's a good antidote to the Times in terms of getting opinions from all different areas. Um, and I look at those websites a lot. Um, and I look at a lot of pop, pop culture news um, because it's sort of the staple of television mm -hmm. these days and more than I would like. Um, and, I've, and I was reading so much stuff when I was doing world news that I, that I cut out magazines. So they just didn't have time for them. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to go back, probably The Economist, which I think there's a magazine called The Week, which I think is pretty I love good. The Week now. is fabulous. It's yeah. very good. Yeah. Um, very few people know about it, but it's good. And the covers are real good. Mm. Um, uh, they're very clever. Um, but, but I'm not, so it's much easier to say what I was reading a year ago because I'm not doing a lot, and I will start to read more um, as we settle down. But the basic daily staple is the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And what are you watching? <laughs> um, yeah, now, let's get to the audience questions. <laughs> <laughs> what are you watching? <laughs> I, have a, I, you know, I have a loyalty to ABC News, which is very strong. Um, I believe in ABC News. I love those correspondents. I'm, I, and I watch when I watch. But I don't watch as much as you might think. I watch uh, maybe once a week. Um, I'm really interested in which, and I wa actually I go back, you know, the show's online, and you can, so I watch it online uh, if I'm not there at 6.30, which I'm not as much as I used to be. Well, I had to be because I was doing the show and making money for it. Um, <laughs> that would be a little tough. And it was, it was a good living, too, I want to say. Um, but, um, uh, so I watch it online some. 
but I'm really interested in why they made the decisions they made. Why did Diane do that? Why did they give that to this correspondent or whatever? I watch it too much as, as somebody who's still got his head in the daily production of the show as opposed to just a viewer. Uh, but I w am loyal to ABC News. I will always be loyal to ABC News. Um, I've got the ABC logo tattooed on my tush somewhere, and, uh, and uh, I believe in them. And, um, and so I, that's, the, that's the program I prefer. Elva Bryant's very good, and, and Katie does a better show than she gets credit for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Her producer is a very good friend of mine and uh, lives, eats, and breathes the news, and, yes, and uh, that's, a, that's a good news organization. And used to work at ABC. Pardon? And used to work at ABC. And used to work at, well, yeah. <laughs> he, he used to work at ABC and NBC and <laughs> CNN and whatever. There's a lot of itinerant people in the business. He's one of them. I note that Brian Williams is doing a, a new ad, which I think speaks to the times. It says, we know that many of you cannot be here with us at 6.30, so we encourage you to tape the show to watch later. What do you think is the top rated, what do you think is the top rated program at 10 o'clock at night, every night? Anybody know? Um, Pre-recorded material. Uh, people are watching DVRs mm -hmm. or, I don't think TiVo is still around, but they're, recording, they're watching recorded material or things that you, you know, discs that you buy at the, at the, uh, at the, at the store, um, but that has a larger viewing population than anything that's actually appearing on television at the time. Uh, and so it's, it is a matter of course that you're eventually going to get around to saying, hey, people, DVR our show and watch it later. That's a smart strategy, though. It is a good strategy. It is not a strategy that the advertisers love. Yeah, well, that's true. Which yeah. is why, um, why I'm sort of impressed that they're doing it. Because I don't think from an advertising standpoint it's, it's very smart. By the way, this is just a pet hobby horse of mine, so I'm going to try it out on all of you. The, the average age of the viewer of the ABC Evening News is in the upper 50s. Um, and it's getting older all the time. One of the things that drives me crazy, just drives me nuts, is the advertisements in the show. Mm -hmm. We wonder why we can't get a younger audience. <laughs> if you do all of your ads for adult diapers, <laughs> for arthritis medicines, and has any of you ever heard before of shaken leg syndrome? I had never heard of that. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, I don't know anybody who has shaken leg syndrome. <laughs> Uh, nobody's ever said to me, God, I can't stop my leg from shaking. I just have never had that. And yet, by God, there we are advertising it all the time. Or some poor old woman out in a park doing, you know, uh, uh, these exercises. And she's, I don't still know what medicine she's supposed to buy. But I used to go to the sales department and I said, please give me a Buick ad. Just something that's a little different. Let's advertise cornflakes. I don't care. Sell it to them at a discount. Because I believe that if you put on ads that are all those, you know, patent medicines or prescription medicines, you're basically saying to somebody who's 25 years old or 30 years old, we don't care about you. We're only interested in an older audience, and that's what you're going to get. Now, if you want to bring people into the newscast, the sales department went nuts when I used to say that, so I probably shouldn't say it now. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I want ads that at least say to a... And, and I believe if you discount that ad to Buick or if you discount that ad to the cereal or whatever, you're going to bring in younger viewers, your ratings will go up, and then your ad revenues will eventually get to where they were before. I'm the only person in the entire network who believes that. <laughs> I am so alone in that, uh, so alone in that belief, uh, and I could never get them to change. Um, I think we're at the time. By the way, if anybody has shaken leg syndrome, I apologize. <laughs> um, I mean you no disrespect, and I, I hope your leg recovers soon. I think you've come as a part of the program that you've dearly asked for, the, where the audience gets to ask you questions. But I would like to ask this final one as we go into that, and that's, do you miss it? No. Um, there's, a lot, there's lots of answers for this, but I had done it for 33 years. There were people, uh, I had fronted a major ABC program for 23 of those 33 years. Good Morning America for 19 and World News for four. And I'm 67 years old and it's time uh, to step aside. 
uh, I just felt it was time. You don't want, you want to leave, uh, as I said in the last broadcast, you want to leave, uh, you don't want to overstay your welcome. Uh, you don't want your hosts for the weekend looking at their watch saying, when the hell is he going to get out of here? Um, um, and I didn't want to do anything on the air that, you know, David Brinkley did some stuff on the air in his latter days, and there's nobody I revere more than David. Um, that were just he was he he should have stepped off the stage, and there are, there are people who can do it. God bless Barbara Walters; she's still as sharp as a tack and is and is terrific and is a great friend of mine. Um, but it's I think it's risky to do it too long. Also, um, to be absolutely totally honest with you, um, when they started talking about going to Afghanistan, much as I wanted to go and talk to soldiers and whatever, I just didn't have I didn't think I could do a trip like that justice. And if you're not, if, if you're not just hungering to go when the bell rings, it's time to get out. And um, so I did. And, and also, there's stuff you want to do. I want to travel and I want to spend time with my grandchildren and whatever. And, and I think it's better to leave wanting more than it is to. So do I miss it? Election night, I missed it. You know, I... I uh, um, I like John McCain. He's a, he's a, to the extent that any politician, you don't, you don't want to be friends with people that you cover. But, but I liked him. I like him a lot. And I don't know if he'd have been a good president or not. But on, what was it, November, what was the date? November 4th mm -hmm. of 2008, to say to this country, to be able to say to this country, we, you know, we, we waited until 11 o'clock when California closed and we could call California and Washington. We don't call an election until somebody's over 270 electoral votes. But to say to the country, you have just elected an African-American president of the United States. I, I was choked up about that. I, and I, I carry no water for the guy. I don't whatever. It just said something to me about this country that is, you just can't help but be proud of the country mm -hmm. when they do that. And that's something I, would, I thought I would never see in my lifetime. And to be able to be the person, Colin Powell said to me when I saw him, uh, he said, when you said that, I was watching you that night, and it just gave me chills. And I said it gave me chills to say it. Somebody, as I walked into the studio, said to me, what's going to be your call? I hadn't thought of that. And um, he, he said, like Al Michaels, you know, when we won the hockey game in 1980, do you believe in miracles? Well, I wasn't going to say, do you believe in miracles, because uh, we, thought, we thought Obama was going to win. Um, but I thought about it during commercial breaks, and I wound up saying that 226 years ago, we had promulgated the document that said that all men are created equal. And it's really questionable whether we believe that. And it's still not a point that we have gotten to in this country, but tonight is as great an affirmation of that as we will probably ever see. I don't think I used those words. I was more eloquent than that, I hope. Um, um, but it, it was a moment. And, and the other thing was I, I thought I'll never have another election night like that again. Mm. But I missed this election night. Um, I missed it. Just uh, you love memorizing the House races and the Senate races and knowing the ins and outs and watching all those damn commercials. Oh, those awful commercials. Um, um, so I got, to do a, I got to do one of the Massachusetts gubernatorial debates. That was fun. Um, that was sort of having your hand back in it. But um, I watched the election night results with my 15 kids in my study group. Slightly smaller audience than I had in 2008, but it was still fun. Okay. It was still fun. Very good. All right, to the microphones, you in the audience who would like to ask questions of Charles Gibson. And there will be questions, not statements. Questions, not statements. So come to the microphone. Come on, don't be shy. If nobody comes, I'll do an interpretive dance. <laughs> no, no, we don't want that. Here like we go. See that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm curious to get your thoughts on how you feel about younger audiences getting more and more of their news from comedy news shows like The Daily Show yeah, and The Colbert yeah, Report. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I think any basis of information is good. Um, I'm always amazed where young people get their news. There was a survey of... Um, Teenagers, where do you get your news? And fourth on the list was music. I, I find that amazing. Um, 
I guess there's a political message in some of the music today. I don't, I don't listen to a lot of it. Um, but wherever you get your news is good. Uh, as I say, if, uh, hopefully you're seeking out objective sources. And, and that's really my hobby horse is just to say to people, please get your news from objective sources. But um, um, there is such a multitude of places that you can get news now. I, I think all of it's good, as I say, if it's, if it's objective. Um, all I want is those young people being involved, caring, um, knowing that this stuff matters and that they be uh, training themselves to be informed voters. That's really, really what's important. Occasionally on Sunday morning, Christiana Poor does her show to specific subjects, almost the entire show. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that format would fly on the evening news, and why hasn't it ever been tried? Well, um, first of all, it's bombing on Sunday morning. I was getting ready to say that. <laughs> uh, um, they're not having great success with that. Uh, Christiane is a, is a terrific journalist, and whatever, but whether her particular talents and interests are, are geared to what the traditional Sunday morning audience is or not, I don't know. It certainly would indicate that it's not. Um, and, you, you know, it's a question of would you want to get up on Sunday morning and hear a good discussion of geo, geopolitical situation in Turkey? I, it's just not what gets you up on Sunday morning. Um, and, and people are so much attuned to politics in the morning. Now, in terms of can you do us? No, you can't. Um, you can, and we did on occasion, would devote the last 15 minutes of the show to one subject, um, which would probably be three correspondent pieces, maybe four. Um, we did that very rarely, but it, we did it on occasion. But basically, your, your charge is to tell people what happened that day, what, they ought, what you think they ought to know, uh, hopefully what they want to know, and, um, and you have to cover that. Now, you can truncate it and try to get it down to 15 minutes if you want, um, and we did on occasion. It was not something that viewers necessarily responded to in terms of ratings. The that I would have is that they get too hung up in what I'll call box score politics. Sure. And it seems the issues are actually secondary to who's winning the poll or mm -hmm. who got ahead in this or that. I just read a study. Uh, you're right. It's a problem. Uh, it's something that we try to guard against, but you're right. Um, uh, I just saw a study of USA Today during the health care debate. It did 78 stories on the health care debate, and eight of them, I think, were involved with the actual content of the bill. And the other 70 were who's up, who's down, what, you know, who's offering amendments, or whatever. Uh, it's a terrible problem. Um, you tend to gravitate to the horse race aspects of elections, um, and, and you don't spend as much time as you should on, on the governance that may result. Um, it's a very valid criticism. And um, now I will tell you, this is a little thing that very few people know. We have minute by minute ratings. Um, you can see in a graph exactly how many people are watching all the way through the half hour. And if a story, I, I, I hated to look at them, didn't look at them, didn't want to know them, but they're like crack to producers. Um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and, and you talk about an addiction. Um, and you can tell, even in a minute and a half correspondent piece in an evening newscast, whether it gives you a net gain or a net loss of audience. And, and I hate to say it, but, you know, um, issue pieces, uh, whatever. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. So I grew up with journalists like yourself and... Peter Jennings. I didn't see you around the house. I didn't. <laughs> <Yeah. know. laughs> I think I, I was hiding in that. Point. Anyway, right. so but the wrote with faces who are the news. This is who I go to for my news, and sort of following up to the question about young people and where they get their news, and what you mentioned about um, what would you tell young journalists who want to go into this field. Are there any sort of younger faces now coming up in television news that you feel like they could be? this person in an objective field, or will it be more of the John Stewart's and the Keith Obermans? Oh, yeah, I didn't really answer the question, I guess, very well about the John Stewart's and, and, uh, and, and Stephen Colbert's. Uh, as I say, I think, you know, if you're getting information from those shows, um, I, I, my wife and I have a huge debate about John Stewart. She's a huge fan. I think he's brilliant. Uh, I think his, his research staff is brilliant. I just worry at times that satire can, can drift into ridicule. And, and I don't, 
I, one of the reasons I don't like the, the acrimony that shows up on the cable channels and the, you know, when they have those debates and they throw everybody into the gladiator pit and have mm -hmm. them go at one another. Um, politics is serious business. Governance of this country is serious business. And it's not, and, and I, I'm just vaguely uncomfortable with every night making light of it. Now, having said that, you know, Will Rogers was one of the great satirists of, in, in America, and we've, satire is a great tradition in America. So I'm really hung up on the John Stewart issue. Um, but I, but I, again, I come back to what I answered in the question, which is if you, if you watch that, if you're getting information from it, uh, and if you can sift through, as I say, what is, what is sometimes ridicule, um, okay, that's fine. Um, and in terms of where, uh, so I apologize. I got off on that because I didn't answer the John Stewart question. So shout for me in the back what it was you asked. Are there any people now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it is one of the curiosities of television news, and I benefited from this, that, that you can be an anchor person and, and, and you can make a lot of money by doing less work. That sounds strange. Um, because you're not, you know, all the time out, um, and you're not driving 14 hours to get to the site of the hurricane or whatever. Um, and you become the face of the, but there was no greater honor in my lifetime than being the face of ABC News, this organization that I loved. The problem is, strange enough to come back to ratings issues, people have trouble watching people younger than themselves. I don't know why that's the case, but... Um, as ABC News, as you may remember, tried an experiment. I didn't get the job when Peter died. Um, they gave it to Bob Woodruff and Elizabeth Vargas. Mm -hmm. And for reasons Elizabeth got pregnant, Bob got blown up in Iraq. And, and, um, but the experiment was not, was, was not necessarily going to be successful. It never had time to really find out whether it was going to work or not. But there's something about people wanting news from older faces. And God knows I'm older than everybody, so uh, so maybe that was was why it worked. When Peter was young, very young, Peter Jennings, um, he was in his 20s, was anchor of ABC News, and it failed, didn't work. And Peter went off, terrific broadcaster that he is. He he earned his stripes in the field. He came back 15, 20 years later, and was a very successful anchor at ABC. There's something about that that I don't know. Now there's some really terrific young people at ABC News who are coming along. Uh, Dan Harris is one, um, Sharon Alfonsi, um, uh, David Muir. These are really good writers and, and good broadcasters, and, and they'll be anchors soon. Um, but, uh, but for some reason, uh, people are just not comfortable looking at younger people. I don't know why. Uh, Dan Harris and David Muir came from this market. They came from Boston, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted to go into journalism, what should they study? Should they study journalism? Should they study politics? Should they study economics? Yes. <laughs> All of those. But the one thing I say to, to, uh, uh, to people is don't study broadcasting. Don't go to broadcasting schools necessarily. Um, write. Just write and write and write. Um, you know, people think television news is not, they think it's a picture medium. But I can tell you, every one of the most successful correspondents at ABC News are the best writers. Uh, if you, can, you know, I used to say to my friends at the New York Times, you have this luxury of being able to um, get a point across in three paragraphs. I have a clause. And, and that's all I have. And, and so you've got to listen carefully, but, but you have to be able to convey it in very condensed chunks. So writing is the key. And then, you know, the broader based your knowledge of history, of politics, of economics, of sociology, of psychology, um, are really important. And I think young people do better to go out, go to small stations, if you can get a job, and, and do it. Make your mistakes. I mean, I, st I started in Lynchburg, Virginia, and if I could, I, if, I mean, I couldn't catalog the number of mistakes I made <laughs> on the air and the dumb things I did and the whatever. Uh, but the audience was very forgiving, um, and uh, it was a great place to learn my craft. It was smack in the middle of school desegregation in a, in a city that really struggled with race relations, and uh, a newspaper 
that would not publish a story about a black person. Would not publish a story about a black person. Dunbar High School in Lynchburg, Virginia, when I was there for the newspapers, did not exist. Didn't have a football team, didn't have graduation, didn't have anything. Uh, didn't exist because that was the Old South, and that was the center of, of, uh, of massive resistance in Virginia, which was uh, opposed to desegregation of schools. Lynchburg was going through desegregation, busing, all that. It was a great place to learn your craft, but the times I messed up, whew. I was going to say a behind-the-scenes story about ABC and your colleague Barbara Walters, whom I work with at 2020. People don't realize that the base of her career is, was as a writer, and we would go into those weekly meetings at 2020, and there's a string strip of writer sitting there and she would read the copy and say that's not quite right and then in her head would rewrite it and they'd have to keep a tape recorder I have never seen anything like it no and we're all like what I have, it takes no. me 15 it's really a rare gift <laughs> I, and, and I can't I don't have it uh, I, if, if I when I used to get scripts from correspondents and I and I knew I didn't like the piece I couldn't sit there. there there are producers who can sit there and say well you move this graph up to here and you move this sound bite down here and you take this out and you change the lead this way and would hand it back, and they could do that in a minute. I would have to sit down at the typewriter, <laughs> talk about how old I am. Um, at the computer. <laughs> at the computer, and I would have to actually start from scratch and rewrite the piece. That's the only way I could do it. Um, and yeah. so, you know, the show was over by the time I got the piece rewritten. <laughs> um, so other people uh, were better at it than I was. Yeah. Hi. Uh, could you comment on what my perception is that there's less fact-checking going on. Mm. Oh, boy, is there ever. And yep. things get printed yep. or yep. said on yep. television yep. as yep. fact, and yep. then they're not a la the yep. Agriculture Department fiasco. Yep, yep, yep. you're right. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, really? You know, the, the, the fact-checking at Time Magazine used to be famous. I mean, the, the degrees to which they had fact-checkers was, I remember an article was done that I was involved with, and the, and the, Time, Mag, uh, the Time Magazine people called me, and I mean, they're going over it almost word by word. And I was really impressed with all that. Um, the old TV guide, when they the, would do stuff on me, they were very good on fact-checking or whatever. It just doesn't occur anymore. It's because of the economics of the business. Excellent. You know, when you take a quarter of the people out of ABC News, you're cutting muscle as well as fat. And, and that's a large part of where it goes. Uh, and my friends at Time Magazine tell me, you know, they write it, it goes into the magazine now. Um, people will tell you the same thing at the Times. It's just, you know, it's, it's one of the places that, that it, it's noticed when there's mistakes, for sure, but it's noticed less than some of the other things that, that where you might be cutting money. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real problem. It is a real problem in journalism right now. And if you the people who go out the door are, have the historical information as well. Yep, yep. You don't have yep. anybody checklist. Yep. Thank you. Mm. I wish I had something more optimistic to say to you. Yep. Good evening. I just want to say how much I've enjoyed um, listening to you. And I actually have two questions. Um, my husband and I oftentimes discuss how broken the political system seems to be in Washington. And you pretty much confirmed from where you sit that that is the case. Do you see any strategy or any way that um, things could possibly turn around? And how do you think that's going to come well, about? Well, you know, it's a, it's a terrible thing. I, you know, I was going through all the things in the, that the legislature, i.e. the United States Congress, has not done and seems incapable of getting to. Um, but it is sort of an axiom that legislatures don't deal with problems until they crater. And uh, I don't know... Uh, what the tipping point, uh, to use Malcolm Gladwell's uh, phrase, um, is going to be in that regard. Um, some people on the Hill, in this conjunction with this work I've done, are saying there's going to have to be some sort of total collapse of the dollar, another terrorist attack, something. But the first terrorist attack didn't bring about much unity on Capitol Hill. Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer to that question, except I hope it's not. Um, what they, in their most pessimistic moments, say, i.e., we need some sort of a national crisis before, uh, before some of these problems will get addressed. Uh, you know, you, we've got the immigration problem hanging over us. People want the borders secure. We've got 12 million people in this country who are illegal immigrants, if the estimates are to be believed. Um, you, you just can't ignore that, you know? I mean, uh, people are very highly upset about the idea of amnesty or whatever. The DREAM Act can't even get supported, and these are kids who are going to college, and 
and into the military. Uh, don't we want them in the military if you know that they're, they're going to be here in this country? Um, but you can't get you can't get that passed. Um, so I don't you know I don't know what's going to take to address the immigration problem. How can you ignore 12 million people who are here illegally and, and and come up with some solution about what to do with it and sit down and figure this out? George Bush uh, had what I thought was a very reasonable solution as the governor of Texas. Uh, I think he was very enlightened on this issue. Um, um, but but John McCain just said to me the other day, I'm going to get hammered if I go back and and uh, try to propagate the bill that I was talking about in the 2008 campaign. Um, it's just it's just not politically palatable to to address the problem now. Maybe it will be in the future. Okay, here's what we're going to do for the last those of you still in line. I know you have a, another question. I'm going to ask to you to tell me all of your questions, and I'm going to ask. Charlie to be shorter in his answers, and we're going to get everybody out on time. So your second question was? I think uh, she just told me I'm being long, too long. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I missed the message there. I don't, I don't know. If do I you, am, I apologize. Do you think that in, 20, in 2012, President Obama can win again? Okay, so hold on. I you? have a face ah, idea. Okay. Hold on. Yes, um, here. You talked to us about looking for objectivity in the news, yeah. and I'd like to know if there are any um, journalists that write for the New York Times or other major newspapers or periodicals, magazines, that you particularly admire for showing that objectivity in their writing. Okay, hold on. Last one. On a slightly different note, I was wondering if you could share with us your feelings on the morning of September 11th as I watched you cover this horrible yeah. piece as a journalist and as a human being. Okay. First question, President Obama, 2012. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm terribly bad at predicting things. Um, I think if unemployment stays uh, close to 10%, it's going to be awfully hard for him to win. Um, it is the economy, stupid, that does um, so much influence elections. It is a relatively weak Republican field. Uh, the nominee will come um, probably, if you had to pick one right now, from either the group of governors or from Fox News. Um, okay. You're applauding that. <laughs> Mike Huckabee is at Fox uh, News. Good uh, news. Fox News yeah, is yeah, uh, Mike yeah. Huckabee, Sarah Palin uh, Newt Gingrich, yeah. or Sarah Palin. That's right. uh, the governors are uh, Pawlenty now, who stepped down in Minnesota, Romney from Massachusetts, Mitch Daniels of Indiana, um, Haley Barber from Mississippi, mm -hmm. and maybe this guy in New Jersey, Carney. He's got national ambitions, I think. Um, he's a little new yet. Uh, this guy Rubio in Florida is an interesting case uh, who might be considered to be vice president. Um, but it will, I think, come at the moment, if you had to pick somebody, it would come from that field. Um, but in so many cases, and I think it'll be true in 2012, an election turns out to be a referendum on the incumbent. And um, so in some respects, you can't judge the strength of the Republican candidate. It's a question of how strong Obama will be. Um, in the case of um, objective uh, correspondence or uh, objective columnists or whatever in the New York Times, um, I think Matt By, for instance, is a terrific. But I don't want to really get into to, uh, to naming specific people. Um, I don't think that's fair to all the people I would leave out. You, you know who you read who's objective and who's not. And I would leave it really to you to make that judgment. Um, in terms of 9-11, uh, very quickly, um, it was a hell of a morning. And we were on the air on Good Morning America, and we had just finished a segment that had run over with Sarah Ferguson on weight loss, of all things. <laughs> and we had run over, and because uh, we always run over with everything, and we had to cancel a segment. And Diane and I were sitting there discussing what we were going to do for, for what was going to be just a minute and 45 between commercials. And somebody, we'd just gotten a one-minute queue, and somebody said into our ear, something's going on at the World Trade Center. There are flames coming out of the side of the building. Something has hit the building. It may be an airplane. You're on the, we have a traffic camera uh, pointed at the building. You're on the air, go. <laughs> and that's all we knew. So you say, something's going on at the World Trade Center. Um, there's flames coming out of the side of the building take to the camera. Now we're not on camera. We're narrating over picture. We're writing notes like mad about, you know, what year was it that the, that, that blind shake had, was behind an attack on the World Trade Center? 
Um, what year was it that a plane flew into the into the Empire State Building? Um, I mean, we're just madly writing notes trying to get answers, and we got researchers running around like mad. And we had a correspondent who lived right in the shadow of the World Trade Center, Don Daler, now works for the local CBS station. And he called in, and he said he'd heard a high whine, mm. and it was his impression that it might be a shoulder-fired missile. And but he, but it, it was too big for that. And we were discussing the size of this. We're also writing how many people work in the World Trade Center buildings, um, and then divide by two because it's just one tower, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as we were doing this, something came into frame. And it's amazing how fast your mind works. My first thought was, you know, it's forest fire season in September, and I'm thinking maybe it's one of those planes with a, you know, a bucket suspended below it. And then I thought, where would you get that in New York? Uh, you know, that's not, not something you're going to find in New Jersey. Um, and, and then I thought maybe it's a traffic copter, and then it hit. And that flame came out the other side. And I will forever, there's an exhibit on this at the, uh, at the Smithsonian right now, which has a lot of us who are on the air on it. And, and I will forever uh, wonder about what I said and what Diane said, because uh, I wish I'd had her reaction. She said, oh, my God. And I said, now we know what's going on. We're under attack. This has got to be a concerted attack on the United States. And mine was the who, what, why, where answer, and hers was the, you know, the human answer. Um, and Diane, when we finally had a break, she said, how many thousands of people are dead? Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it was for the next three weeks, four weeks, Peter was unbelievable during that period of time. He was just on the air almost nonstop. But we would go on the air on GMA at 6 a.m., an hour early, and then we would broadcast till noon because Good Morning America doesn't go off the air in Los Angeles until noon. So we were doing six hours to the whole network every morning. And when I walked into the studio on September 12th, we'd been up almost all night booking guests and trying to get the mayor and all the, you know, and, and people whose lives were touched by all this. It was amazing. We had people at all the hospitals, you know, looking for wounded, and there weren't any. You were either alive or you weren't. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was disturbing in and of itself. But I remember walking into the studio the next day and thinking the specifics of who we've spent all night trying to book and the whatever, are not as important as the tone that we're going to adopt this morning. And I've never really had considered that before, but the tone had to be, we're all at the breakfast table together. We are, as a country, learning about this. We're learning about it at the same time you are. And, and we're going to get through this. And, it's, and you know, I don't want to assume any kind of responsibility for something that, that is beyond really what I'm paid to do. But it just occurred to me that how we react to this as those who were the faces of all this was really important. And it's a horrible thing to say, but we had 4,000 planes in the air that morning. They got four. Um, there's millions of people who live in New York. They killed a lot of people, but they didn't destroy the fabric and the guts of this country. And the other thing that was in my mind was that no matter from now on, you know, we've always been protected by two oceans. But from now on, every time you drive through the Lincoln Tunnel, every time you go across the Golden Gate Bridge, every time you put your kid on a school bus, it's a tiny little act of courage because you don't know. And it has introduced a uncertainty to American life that's not going to go away. It's not as evident anymore. We don't carry that around with us every minute. We don't cry as often at inappropriate times. The number of times I started to cry on the air for reasons that I had, you know, just it all of a sudden would hit you. Somebody would say something or, or somebody would have an expression or it didn't make any difference what it was. You just suddenly found yourself, oh, hell, I'm about to cry, which is okay, um, but you, you don't want to overdo it. Um, but it was just something that was, it was uh, an extraordinary period of time to broadcast. And, and that thought in my mind of what, tonally we do may be more important than what the content is, is something that had never occurred to me before and, and, and really hasn't occurred to me in that magnitude since. Um, 
but that was a hell of a morning to be on television. And and yet, when I walked in the studio, when I walked out of the studio that morning, when I walked back in on the 12th of September, I thought, this is what you prepared all your life to do. Thank you for sharing that. And please thank Charles Dixon.